God's grace, mercy, and peace be yours today through God our Father and through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Anyone who's got even a passing familiarity with the Star Trek franchise knows the Vulcan greeting. Bonus points, I see Ed, yeah, I can see you over there, right? Bonus points if you can make the hand motion. And it is really one of the nicest things that you could say to somebody, isn't it? Even if you might think it's a little cheesy, okay? Live long and prosper. Who doesn't want to live long and prosper? That sounds great. Now, we can debate what a long life looks like. One person's answer might be different than another, but we're not going to zero in on that part. We're going to zero in today on the second part, not because it's a Star Trek sermon, but because this is Ecclesiastes, and Ecclesiastes is all about what does a good life look like? What does it look like to prosper? What does that look like? This question is consuming the author, Solomon. Now, remember Solomon. He was the king of Israel, the second king in the line of kings of David that eventually would lead through the bloodline all the way to Jesus being born many hundreds of years later. And what we get in this book is the observations of a man who is now near, we think, the end of his life and who has had access from God to an almost unlimited measure of tons of different things that people want. Money and power and fame and prestige. This is a person who has devoted his great resources, I'm talking Gates and Bezos level money, to pursuing the good life in all of the ways that we might look at it. How can that be seen? It can be seen in his hundreds of wives and concubines. It can be seen in the glorious houses and new cities that he has established throughout Israel. It can be seen in the horses and the chariots, which are the exotic sports cars and Learjets of their day. It can be seen in the exotic animals that he got imported from faraway places. Solomon was an interesting dude. But what we see as he comes here toward the end of his life is a man reflecting back on all that he has had, all that he has experienced, all that he has done, and there's a strong note of sadness and resignation. Vanity of vanities, he says. Everything is vanity, a chasing after the wind. You might think that Solomon was looking ahead a few pages and checking a sneak preview of the 21st century world, wouldn't you? Because I think most of us can relate to his sentiments. Even those of us who enjoy financial stability know the frustration of what it is to have so much stuff that you don't even have room to house it all, and you've got to rent out a other space to put it, and you might not even remember what's in all of that stuff because it's been packed away for so long and you haven't used it. And so too in the corporate world, stakeholders are tempted to prioritize profits over everything else, and what will often happen? Well, you look at the area that takes up the most of the budget, the 60 to 70% range of the budget that goes to employee salaries and benefits, right? And what do you do if you're going to maximize profits? Well, you look for those things that are going to balance the books. In ways both big and small, we discover by our own experience the same things that Solomon was dealing with almost 3,000 years ago. And that's this. Those who love money are never going to be satisfied with their money. Solomon writes that almost word for word. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. If a person's goal in in life is to become rich, how much is enough? How do you know when you've arrived? Is there some preset limit that you've made for yourself after which you can say, I'm good, I don't need any more? 
What's that number? What, what is the thing in your bank account that is going to make you say, I am good? How much joy does that really bring? How much meaning can be found and how much wealth one has with no other higher ambition or purpose? So too, with an increase in wealth comes those who want their share. We see that in verse 11. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes, right? Oh, hey, look at all the stuff I've got. I must be really good. Yeah, I get to see it. Okay, I own it. Yeah, that's mine. But then you get those people who've got their hand out for more. At first, it might be a little flattering to know that there are these people who are interested in you and attracted to you and want to be around you, and you feel kind of good about yourself with all of that until you start to question their motives. Are they here because they like me, or they like my money, or my fame, or my influence, or whatever the case may be? And you don't have to be rich and famous to relate to this sentiment. Kids deal with this all the time. You meet a new friend, and you're excited to have them come over to your house and play. And they come over, and you've been looking forward so much to playing with this new friend, except pretty soon you get the sense that they're not really all that interested in playing with you. They're interested to see what toys you have. And they want to play with your toys, maybe do a little scouting trip for what they're going to be asking for on their next birthday, right? happens in the halls, of, uh, the, the halls of power as well. I think about all the lobbyists and special interests that go to congressmen and influence the ways that trillions upon trillions of taxpayer dollars are going to be spent. Even leaders in the church will face a temptation to show special favoritism toward those who have more than those who do not. It's in every single aspect of the world, isn't it? And what's more, the riches that we have can be held on to to our own harm. Even if you don't consider yourself to be a wealthy person, this is still true. Solomon says, There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. Now, on the one hand, those hurts can come from the outside, right? Those who would want to defraud or destroy what we have. With greater possessions comes the greater need to protect what we have. You have to expend more time, energy, money, and resources taking care of it. Okay, I need somebody to watch the house. I need somebody to go drive my car at my other property or... Maybe it's time to get an alarm system now that we've got a little nicer house. And maybe I need to invest in security cameras and a ring doorbell. And maybe if it starts to get really big, right, I have to let go of my safe and I need to get a nice safety deposit box in an ultra-secure location to make sure that I am really keeping my things safe. But I think the greater threat than those from without are those that come from within. That harm that comes from within our twisted human hearts that are looking for something, anything, to be able to look to satisfy that hole that can only be filled by God. Money provides earthly power, and we know what power does. Power corrupts. I think about that gospel lesson today from Mark chapter 10, which built on the lesson from last week. What happened last week? There was a rich young man who comes to Jesus and says, Sir, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus tells him, Sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then come follow me. And the man walks away sad because he has great wealth. He rejects the very gift of the greatest riches possible in order to hold on to his earthly wealth. That's tragic. Well, so too... It's something that we will often face in this world in ways big and small as the love of money can turn people from not only turning against God but also the relationships that are in their life. I think about that in verse 17 where it talks about the person with their great wealth sitting in much vexation, sickness, and anger. And maybe you had the picture of Scrooge pop up into your brain, okay? Or maybe a Scrooge that you know 
or maybe the Scrooge that you sometimes are toward others. How many families have seen siblings turn on each other over the question of what to do with mom and dad's inheritance left down for them? And then on top of all that, remember that the riches that we have can flee from us at any moment. Solomon recounts the sad story of a man who lost everything and he had a son that he wasn't able to support. Maybe that resonates with you. If you've ever lost income or lost a job entirely or had a business that was failing or went under, and you know that feeling of going and looking at your family member in the face and how hard it is to look at them and know that you're unable to provide in the ways that you want to be able to do. And so, too, that can leave us in the form of medical catastrophes. And those stories hit us where we really live, don't they? Because they foreshadow something about the reality that every single one of us, without qualification, is going to face someday, if you haven't already, in the life of significant family members. And that's this. Whether at the moment of our death or at the moment of Jesus' return, whichever comes first, every single one of us, no matter how secure or grand or ready to pass on an estate to our loved ones, our possessions are, are going to render themselves worthless Solomon writes, as he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again naked as he came, and he shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. Anyone here feeling a little depressed after all of this? It wasn't my intention to depress you. But it is how Solomon talks, isn't it? And there's a kind of sad winsomeness to this message mixed with care a grandfatherly kind of care of a person who has experienced life and has some wisdom to be able to pass on to others. The best kind of wisdom, the wisdom that is learned the hard way, and you share that wisdom in the hopes that perchance someone else won't have to experience the same hardships you had, that you can gift them with this wisdom so they can avoid some of these pitfalls in their own lives. That's the kind of thing that I see Solomon doing here. Instead of chasing after these things that are not going to give us satisfaction, what does true prosperity look like? He's got wisdom to offer as someone who has gone there, been there, done that, didn't work. Let me tell you what does. And it keeps with a theme that goes on in the rest of this book of Ecclesiastes that hits at an even deeper root issue, and that's this a deceptive lie, the lie that prosperity and the good life are found in your own self-sufficiency and independence, that you don't need anyone else. At some level, we're all tempted to believe if I just gathered a little more stuff, if I just gained a little more knowledge, if I just hobnobbed with the right kind of people, if I just had the right onerous restrictions put on me from outside, pulled away, then I would be freed to live the good, prosperous life. It's a deception. And then you know what God does? in ways subtle or magnificent, he crushes our idolatry of independence and reminds us of our smallness. He nudges us back into the places that make an eternal difference. Solomon calls them his lot in life. What is your lot in life? What are those places that God puts under your charge, those relatively small and in the grand scheme of things insignificant, but they are your charge, your home, 
your workplace or your school, your community, your church, these places that are our lot. We like to think that we've got things under control. There's a special sense of peace that we feel when we're deluded to think that we are under that control, isn't there? I've got it. It's handled. It's done. I know what I'm doing. I'm confident. I'm self-sufficient. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to make the world a better place. Or at least shape my own little world the way I want it to be. And you dare not come and try to impose anything on me in my world that would usurp my control of my self. No, the world's maker comes along and says, not so fast, little guy. Not so fast, little gal. See, the thing is, for the child of God, not being in control, it's not a bad thing. It's just not. Not being in control isn't so much about, oh, look at me, I'm so small, I've got this little lot in life, I'm so insignificant. No. Being out of control means that we focus on the one who is. The focus on our smallness is more about the focus on God's greatness and the fact that he is for us. He calls us to stop chasing after our prosperity in all of these paths of our own design, our own idolatry, our own freedoms, and instead asks us to do the bold and crazy thing to trust that he has actually already done everything necessary to guarantee your prosperity, guarantee your good life today, tomorrow, and forever by giving you Jesus and not the prosperity of the accumulation of things or influence or power, but the prosperity of eternal life with him and being his child. And that news has the power to give us real joy in a way that a wad of cash never will. It makes me think of the Old Testament, or sorry, the New Testament figure Zacchaeus. Remember Zacchaeus? He shows up in Luke chapter 19. He's a tax collector. And he is someone who is well familiar with the emptiness of chasing prosperity through the accumulation of more wealth. Because the results of his accumulation of wealth have impoverished him spiritually and led to broken relationships with the rest of his community. As his pocket is overflowing, his heart is desperate for Jesus. And so here we have, imagine, the God of heaven come down purposefully walk down to Jericho, seek out this man Zacchaeus. And what does he do? Jesus, the good shepherd, like he's calling a wayward lost sheep wandering off on his own, calls out, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. Zacchaeus, follow me. Jesus calls Zacchaeus by name like a loving shepherd calling his sheep. The same way that he calls his sheep today by name. Insert name here. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And suddenly Zacchaeus has found this new joy in being an instrument of God's grace. The liberating work of Jesus has freed him. Freed him not to pursue his freedoms and his rights for their own sake. Instead, freed him to love and serve his neighbors with the lot that God has charged to him. Use your gifts that God has given, your time, your talents, your treasures, Zacchaeus, to serve me and my kingdom's ends. And for Zacchaeus, what does that look like? It looks like helping the poor that he's defrauded. It looks like reconciling relationships that have been damaged. This is his lot in life to look after those things in his community. What is your lot? What does the gospel free you to do? 
Jesus calls you by name just as surely as he called Zacchaeus by name when you were washed in that water to find real prosperity in his grace alone. I like the way that Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 8 when he says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus is where we look. We see that poverty to its fullest extent as he gives himself for you and me on the cross, the extreme poverty of death, so that we sinners who are often rich in things but poor in soul would be made prosperous in him. We taste that richness as we gather here around the mysterious presence of his body and his blood for us. And we rejoice treasuring the forgiveness and eternal life that he gives to us. We rejoice in the daily benefits and pleasures of the everyday, food and drink and work and family and friends and community. We rejoice in the opportunities that God gives us and our lot in life to bless others through the gifts that he has given us. Because what are all of those things after all? They're his. Whatever it is that you have, you may consider yours. You may think about the work that it has taken to accumulate them and craft them and control things to try to maximize them. But that's all an illusion. They're gifts from God given to you to manage for his purposes. For the good of the growth of his kingdom. To love other people and to share Jesus with the world. What's your lot in life that God has freed you to be able to use to serve his purposes? We use those resources wisely. In Jesus, we discover what real prosperity looks like. Even better, in Jesus, we discover a God who is committed to giving us true prosperity to his great glory and to our great joy. God bless you today in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.